Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Institute, and I appreciate you joining me for this very special event. At the outset of today's event, on behalf of myself, on behalf of all my colleagues here at the Washington Institute, I want to extend our condolences to the innocent victims of last weekend's horrific terrorist attack by Hamas. The 900 or so Israelis and others from around the world, including what, what appears to be 11 confirmed Americans, um, to all of them, to their families, um, to the people of Israel, um, to all civilized people around the world outraged by what we have seen, the barbarity of what we have seen this weekend, I extend our deepest condolences. I believe that there's an inflection point that is going on in the Middle East at the moment that is analogous to the inflection point of uh, 9-11. Um, and this will require us to rethink many of the presumptions, the basic paradigm with which we here in the United States, many of us as experts, approached politics, society, and conflict in the region. I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a moment. We have a terrific group today. This is the first of a series of sessions that we'll be doing here at the Washington Institute to analyze, assess, and offer advice to our administration on events in the region. Um, but before I do, I want to take that 9-11 metaphor and expand it. Yes, in terms of certain aspects, intelligence failure, the speed, the scope, the audacity of what we saw of this weekend, yes, uh, the metaphor is apt. But in many ways, I think it's so important to underscore that the 9-11 metaphor, in fact, is not adequate if you're certainly, if you're Israeli, to comprehend the impact and the meaning of what happened this weekend. Let me just offer this handful of reasons, six brief reasons why the 9-11 metaphor in fact is not adequate. First, the numbers. Proportionately to population, the numbers killed in Israel were 10 times the numbers killed in 9-11, 10 times. Secondly, the intensity. Israel is a small country. You can drive Israel in half a day, uh, compared, of course, to the length and breadth of our great nation. Um, while, um, uh, while what happened on 9-11 was, uh, was the heinous sort of attack, tens of millions of Americans could wake up the next morning without knowing anyone who suffered that day. That's impossible in Israel, where there's not a single Israeli family who can wake up the next day without knowing someone who suffered and or someone who was deployed in the army as a response. Third, if you'll excuse me, sexuality. The element of rape as part of what happened this weekend just underscores the depth of the depravity that we saw. Fourth, terrorists continued to operate on Israeli soil for multiple days, and some, I believe, are still there today, although it, I think that is about to come to an end. So the length of time of this episode makes it fundamentally different. Fifth, hostages, mass hostages taken across borders an element that never before played a role in the hundred year history of this conflict and an element that, ex that is extremely rare in any conflict. I had to go back to the first Chechen war to find examples of large scale um, taking of hostages across borders. And then sixth, um, as we eventually learned in 9-11, that day was the high point of the enemy's action. Um, uh, we all feared that there may have been more, 
But in the end, there wasn't. And America and its allies went on the offensive from that point on. I think we all recognize, and we're going to talk today and in future days about this, what is going on between Hamas and Israel is potentially the first round of a much larger conflict. And that, of course, could change even more. So um, uh, the 9-11 metaphor, useful, but limited in its utility, utility. And I think we have to change our mindset to begin to comprehend what this does to the people and the leaders of Israel and what it does to people around the Middle East looking at how the Israelis are going to respond. Um, uh, uh, in addition to analogies about 9-11, there are many analogies this week to the October War, 1973, exactly 50 years ago. Um, and indeed, from this very table, um, uh, I hosted an event on the question of strategic surprise during which none of my fellow panelists, um, myself included, anticipated what was going to happen just 72 hours later. Yes, the surprise was great. And as in 1973, um, uh, 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 the Israelis were not de deployed properly to be ready for a surprise. But there, that analogy breaks down too. As we know, Sadat launched war to catalyze peace. And the result was Camp David. And 45 years later, Egypt and Israel are still at peace. Hamas did not start this to catalyze peace. Hamas did not start this to create a two-state solution. Hamas did not start this to energize a dormant peace process. In my view, and we'll get into this with all my colleagues just very briefly, Hamas started this for three reasons. To activate a multi-front threat to Israel, second, to fill a vacuum in Palestinian leadership, and third, to stop the march toward regional peace, including the Saudi-Israel agreement, about which there was so much talk in recent weeks. So let me repeat the obvious. Not only are we not seeing just another phase of Gaza-Hamas-Israel conflict that we've seen periodically in recent years, we're seeing something fundamentally different. And we're seeing an Israeli response that will be fundamentally different too. Um, in that, I know the hostage issues play a huge role, but in my view, if I have outlined what I believe Hamas's aims are, here's what I believe Israel's aims will be in the coming period. First, to decapitate Hamas military leadership and to destroy residual military capability. Second, to install confidence among the Israeli people, once again, that the government of Israel and the IDF provides for their security, confidence that has been sorely shaken in recent days. And third, to replace in the minds of regional actors, friends, foes, and would-be friends, the perception of Israeli vulnerability and weakness that was produced over the weekend and replace it with the idea of Israeli power, dominance, and invincibility. Indeed, I would just not discount the psychological aspect of all this. I think it is critical. All of this augurs for a substantial military effort, one that won't be over soon. Hovering over all this and what you will hear today and in coming days and weeks here at the Washington Institute is the threat of wider circles of conflict, an inner circle that includes uh, the Palestinian arena, Jerusalem, West Bank, Israeli Arabs, a second circle of what I'll call near regionals, Hezbollah, Syria, potentially a related security challenge in, in other places, um, such as Jordan, if Islamist extremists and Palestinian radicals try to test the regime, a test I believe the Jordanians would win. And then the wider circle, Iran. Let me just conclude these introductory remarks by noting that America has a vital role to play in all of this. What we saw this weekend was not just an Israeli tragedy. It was the most significant act of terror against Americans outside US soil since September 11th. For Hamas, a radical Sunni group, one of the very few rationales for making common ground 
with the radical Shiite group Hezbollah or the radical Shiite-led regime of Iran? Why do they, where do they have common ground? It is their fight against the great Satan and their fight against the lesser Satan. Israel, we should remind everyone, is the lesser Satan. America, Israel's friend, ally, and supporter, has always been the great Satan. We cannot run from that reality. Neither, I should say, can America's Arab friends run from it. They weren't the direct targets of Hamas, but if Israel is weakened, they become more vulnerable. That explains, in my view, the generally lukewarm and equivocal statements that we've seen from Arab capitals. When Israel appears vulnerable, they will look for cover. Reestablishing the fact and the image of Israeli strength is in their interest, which makes it in our interest too. I look forward to discussing all these issues with my colleagues. Uh, today, we're focused on the inner core, the Hamas attack, Israel's response and implications. As I said before, we'll be having another event on Thursday to look at the, uh, the potential for escalation on the Northern Front and um, further programming. Uh, please go to the Washington Institute website to learn about that. With that, I'm gonna to turn to my colleagues. I'm delighted that from Israel is joining us our Lafer International Fellow, Ehud Ya'ari. Um, then I'm going to turn um, to the director of our Reinhard Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence, our former Wexler Fellow, Dr. Matthew Levitt, sitting here in America, here right next to me uh, on my right. Then uh, immediately on my left, I'm, I'm really thrilled and fortunate that at the moment we have as a visiting fellow at the Washington Institute, Naomi Newman, who until not too long ago was director of research at the Israeli security agency, the Shin Bet, Shabak, uh, which has um, uh, uh, authority and responsibility over um, uh, to keep an eye on Palestinian territories. And then on my far left, um, uh, geographically, not, uh, not politically, is my colleague, Rachel Omari, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the Gilbert Senior Fellow here at the Washington Institute, um, uh, an expert on Palestinian politics. Delighted to have all of you with us today. We're going to begin with my colleague in Israel, Ehud Ya'ari. Ehud. Thank you, uh, Rob, for your wise comments. Uh, usually I'm blunt, and uh, this evening, my time, I'm not going to mince words. Uh, I take it from my mother, 104 years old, that this is the darkest moment that she remembers in the history of Israel since the darkest days of the War of Independence in 1948. The second point is we are already in the midst of a multi-front confrontation. Different intensity on different fronts, but we are there. In my family's home village of Metula, the northernmost point of Israel, they are telling everybody who doesn't really have a good reason to stay there to evacuate. The same goes for many, many other villages and kibbutzim and townlets all around the uh, north. And, and sorry, and it's my nephew just came from Thailand and went to his uh, brigade in the north. Um, I apologize. Uh, and uh, uh, if I may have a open disclosure. In the kibbutz, it's called Kfaraza, where my childhood friends from the youth movement settled many years ago, dozens were killed. 40 babies, not even toddlers, were massacred, many of them beheaded. What we saw there is Einsatzgruppen disguised as Hamas. That's what it was. And this is how most Israelis 
see it. Now, Israel had enough information to know that there was an attack coming. Probably, I did not establish yet, uh, this yet. Finally, they didn't have the zero hour. Just like on the eve of the 1973 war, but they knew and they saw the preparations. And again, like 1973, we have two, what somebody calls peacock generals at military intelligence who knew better, who decided that our policy since 2009 of getting along with Hamas through economic benefits and the occasional round of fighting, etc., is working. They said, no, she'll be fine, mate. And what happened was that the fence around Gaza, 70 kilometers, it's not, uh, in parts, it's just a fence, it's, in parts, it's a, it's a wall was unguarded by the Gaza division, the Firefox divisions. So when you try to defend 70 kilometers with three companies, it's not going to work. And of course it didn't. There was one place which gives an example of how it should have developed. In one of the now scorched earth, beautiful blossoming uh, region of Israel, what we call the Gaza envelope, 22, 23 kibbutzim and villages, which are now destroyed and burned down. Only one remains almost intact because they had a young lady heading the, the only one, the local security squad. And she understood before anybody else in the army what was going on. She had their alert squad spread around the uh, perimeter and prevented the Hamas killers from coming into the kibbutz and doing what they did in Kfar Aza in Be'eri going house from, from house to house, just butchering people. That's the scene. And this is why my mother is saying what she said. Even in the war of independence, we never had any scene like this. Second thing, why was the intelligence, why were the intelligence uh, chiefs so wrong? Because since 2009, they came to believe it works. We allow uh, Gazan uh, uh, workers to come to Israel. We provide fuel and Qatari money and etc. And they were married to this again, 73 conceptions. So, when the Hamas facing Israeli technological superiority, undoubtful, came over the fence with motorized gliders and tractors, etc., there was nobody to stop them. And the distance between the fence and the, the 22, 23 kibbutzim and 11 army positions is very short. It was not just two battalion commandos of Hamas that crossed, probably the only two battalion commandos they had. There were many Gazans coming to plunder and on the way they took with them some hostages. That's the scene and it took hours to uh, intervene. We had 
uh, so girl soldiers there, manning the positions that watch the cut monitor the cameras and the sensors along the fence. At least two dozens of them were butchered in their position because there was no buffer. That's something which is very difficult for any Israeli to accept and understand. Now, less emotional. I beg everybody's pardon. I believe, and I don't have the proof yet, I will have it. This was orchestrated by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards through the visits of the Quds Force Commander General Ismail Khani to Beirut and Damascus and their visits to Tehran, etc., in order to derail progress towards an Israeli Saudi normalization. The Iranians perceive a move in this direction as a direct serious threat. They did not want to take it. Now Hamas, I have known uh, Yechia Sinwar since his days in prison. I used to have a lot of uh, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. Um, many conversations with him in prison. Sinwar didn't want to have a fight in Israel on his own. So my assumption, I will have evidence later on, I'm sure, was the Iranians and Hezbollah were saying to him, through the people they were talking to in Beirut, in case the knife is on your throat, in case the Israeli army invades Gaza uh, forcefully, there will be uh, the uh, activation, the ignition of a Lebanese front and to a lesser extent, Syrian front, because we see the movements there that they are getting ready to send rockets there, probably try to have rockets already. On the Lebanese front, we have everyday rockets to day 15, we have attempts of squad to uh, penetrate uh, into Israel. It's an active front. <clears throat> what is Israel doing? I think what they are doing now is they're trying to get the forces ready for an eventual uh, 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 major uh, advance into the Gaza Strip. They have to decide on how to do it. They have plans, uh, when to do it. Uh, but in my opinion, no hurry. We better prepare the ground and the Air Force is doing it. The Air Force is doing it, let them do their job. When you enter, you have to minimize the uh, capability of Hamas uh, uh, to resist. About the hostages, one, nobody knows the number. Neither Israel, I think even Hamas doesn't know. Uh, they have uh, threatened to execute uh, hostages in return for Israeli bombing. Today, I was carefully checking throughout the days, evening in Israel, the Air Force continued the raids on uh, Hamas targets in Gaza uh, and other places. I didn't hear anything else coming from Hamas about that, but it's a real serious uh, possibility. I would end up by saying that you have, we have entered this confrontation 
in a situation where we had a government and mainly a prime minister who is discredited, who's not trusted by, I would say, more than half the population. And now, four days after the this horrible uh, uh, massacre, he still can't make up his mind about having forming an emergency uh, war cabinet with the opposition. Because some hooligan like Mr. Bengvir, uh, whom he appointed as Minister of National Security, uh, wants to be in that cabinet. And the opposition leaders, rightly so, say, no, we don't need this guy. So it's four days. We don't have a war cabinet that is a signal of unity, of concentrated uh, national effort, uh, uh, effort, and people are wondering. I'll finish by saying one thing. What I saw in my family, in many others, was many international uh, air flight, uh, flights to Israel are canceled. But you should have seen the flight coming in from Bangkok last night. It was all not just my uh, young nephews. It was all young Israelis coming to their reserve units, going up north, going down south, uh, etc. Uh, if they built on the division within Israel and the political turmoil that Bibi has created, I think they are going to be proven wrong. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Ehud. Uh, Matt. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I wish we didn't have to be here. Uh, Ehud, we, you don't need to apologize. We, we appreciate your, your blunt and emotional uh, input. Um, look, I think people need to understand um, the nature of Hamas and the nature of its terrorist uh, infrastructure and capabilities. Uh, and I think there's a disconnect because many people seem to have uh, gotten to the point, certainly in the years since 2007, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force of arms, pointing its weapons, shooting its weapons at fellow Palestinians, that Hamas had somehow changed, uh, that it was no longer a group committed to uh, a violent jihad, uh, that it was somehow more representative of Palestinians in general. Certainly that's, that's its propaganda. Uh, it is not. Um, and that what it was really about was continued siege of Gaza um, um, and occupation. And as it likes to say, uh, whenever it gets a chance defending Jerusalem, in fact, this, this uh, uh, series of terrorist attacks was, was named uh, the Al-Aqsa Flood. In fact, uh, in the years since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, it found itself in a position to do things it never before thought that it could. Limited until then with suicide bombings, targeting buses or cafes, shooting attacks, um, uh, types of things that it is really only still capable, uh, limited to in the West Bank. And the Gaza Strip, it realized that if it played a long game, it could build up an infrastructure, the likes of which most terrorist groups don't get to build by virtue of controlling space, having an effective safe haven, being able to build up a, a, a storage of small arms, a uh, collection of uh, in the early days imported and in the years since um, domestically produced rockets and projectiles that can go various lengths, some of them quite far into uh, north of the West Bank, certainly as we've seen today, Tel Aviv, and to build up a cadre of fighters that they could use in large numbers at a future date. Uh, the many people who thought that Hamas would be co-opted by governance, that it would be too busy collecting garbage and paying the salaries of school teachers to be fully committed to uh, fighting Israel in a large scale war, who thought that Hamas would be deterred by virtue of the fact that there would likely be a significant Israeli retaliation, have been proven wrong in a very painful and bloody way. 
And so today we need to look at Hamas as a militant and terrorist group, not only as one that can carry out your standard terrorist attacks, but as one that could successfully deploy at least a thousand people into uh, Israel in coordinated attacks, an organization that successfully led a disinformation campaign, uh, convincing Israel not only that it could be deterred and that as long as money came in and there were jobs, just last week Israel allowed an additional number of workers to come into Israel from the Gaza Strip, that, that things could be calm, uh, having riots at the fence and using those as cover, shootings in the West Bank, making people think that was the totality of what it was going to do uh, to play a long game. Um, I think it's important to remind Hamas is not about occupation. It's not about the lack of a two-state solution. Hamas opposes a two-state solution. Hamas is about creating an Islamist state in all of historic Palestine to include the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and all of Israel. It's about the destruction of Israel. And that's something I think a lot of people have uh, have lost sight of. Uh, the Israeli Air Force, as Ehud said, is going to be focused right now on trying to uh, destroy as much of their military capability as possible. And that will, of course, involve those that are uh, shooting rockets, but also uh, Hamas defensive capabilities. And here I think it's important to remember the Hamas tunnel system, not the one that was built into Egypt for smuggling and not the one that was dug into Israel before an underground fence prevented those back in the day so that Hamas, back when it was planning an earlier version of this week's attacks, I'm talking about the tunnels domestically within the Gaza Strip that Hamas built specifically so that when the day came that they were able to draw Israel to a ground fight in the Gaza Strip, they would be able to pop up from places unannounced and ambush soldiers. Um, there's also the American angle here, and Rob mentioned this briefly. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the most serious attack targeting Americans uh, since 9-11 uh, abroad. And we don't have the full numbers. The White House said we know of uh, 11 uh, Americans killed. Uh, the likelihood that that number increases is, is painfully high. And we don't know the number, but we do know that there were Americans who were kidnapped uh, into the Gaza Strip. Uh, the FBI will be uh, opening up uh, cases for through, their, through their extraterritorial squad for every American that was a victim of uh, this series of attacks, whether people killed, injured, terrified whether they you know escaped and and of course those who who are kidnapped and will be providing intelligence support to the israelis though i imagine that that will be the limit on this issue because the israelis know what they're doing and and will not need uh, more u.s support and are famous for saying that they're not going to ask someone else to fight for them um, but because there are americans that are held hostage still you can imagine that the u.s intelligence and law enforcement communities are going to be looking at this very very closely they will be looking at things domestically, too. Not that I think that there's any type of Hamas threat in this country in a militant sense, I don't. But you don't need to look far in social media already to see very violent and hateful uh, rallies uh, that uh, not only include, include potential hate crimes, but violence in cities across the United States. And that's going to take the attention of law enforcement as well. We're going to have later opportunities this week to talk more broadly about the likelihood of horizontal escalation, whether it's from Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hezbollah and other Shia militants from Syria, the potential for Houthi missiles at Eilat from the south. But I think it's important here to underscore something Ehud said. I think the likelihood that Hamas decided to take this series of actions knowing that the Israelis would have to retaliate in a very significant way. It's unlikely in the extreme that they would do this without the belief that if push came to shove, other elements of what we call the Iran threat network and what they call the axis of resistance would come to their defense to create other fronts in this war. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen. The West Bank is fairly quiet right now. East Jerusalem is fairly quiet right now. There's been stuff happening on the northern border, but frankly, less than many of us might have expected. Uh, but that certainly is uh, Hamas's hope. Finally, I, I think we need to recognize that this does change everything. Anybody who expects that the response to an attack like this is going to be like previous responses deeply misunderstands the nature of this attack and the nature of its psychological impact on Israel. 
yes, Israel will have to reassert deterrence and Israel will have to convince its own population and others, as Rob said, of its capabilities. But it's much more than that. And at the end of the day, when we come out of the tunnel of the immediate threat that we are in right now, there might be some opportunities. I think that if I were sitting in Riyadh or if I were sitting in Abu Dhabi, and if I were sitting in Jerusalem, one of my big takeaways now, and I think it will still be the case in several weeks, <coughs> is that the regional moderates really do have a lot to be afraid of from Iran and its proxies. And their interest in joining forces for a lot of positive reasons having nothing to do with Iran, but also because of a desire to share intelligence, information, technology, counter drone technology, and, and, and more is very, very real. And I think that in the long run, Iran and Hezbollah and most certainly Hamas have only driven that home. Terrific. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, just before I go forward, I want to uh, tell all of our viewing audience that if you'd like to try to get into this conversation after our series of opening remarks are concluded, there are two ways to do it. If you're on Zoom, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom bar. If you're on some other platform, and I know that um, people uh, may be viewing this on YouTube, on the Institute's website, uh, C-SPAN perhaps, um, if you're viewing it on some other platform, you can email me directly at rsatloff, that's one word, R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F, -F, at washingtoninstitute.org. All right, Naomi Newman, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. With your permission, I would like to start with the uh, bottom line. So um, I agree with my colleagues um, this attack of the Hamas was totally a uh, surprise to Israel uh, in all uh, the way that you look at it. Um, actually, Hamas uh, have changed the rule, um, and now Israel need to change the uh, paradigm uh, regarding Hamas, regarding the uh, Gaza Strip, but maybe also regarding the whole Palestinian arena and the way that uh, um, uh, the Middle East is supposed uh, to be. Um, the um, uh, aim is now to uh, is toppling Hamas regime. It means that it will take a long time, um, um, tremendous effort, and a lot of uh, casualties regarding Israel. So it won't be easy, but there is no other way. Uh, but I think that the real um, things now is that Israel, United States, international elements need to sit right now and think what's gonna be, uh, how can we design or redesign the shape of the, um, uh, the Middle East and the uh, uh, Palestinian arena the day after Hamas. Um, and I hope that after my lecture, I will, understand, I will um, um, show what is not only um, war between Israel and Hamas, it's much more uh, a bigger. So this is the situation I, um, and when I'm talking about Middle East, I'm talking especially about Hezbollah and Iran uh, because Hamas got inspiration, support, funds, means, and know-how for Iran. And this has allowed her actually uh, to uh, develop uh, the tremendous uh, capabilities, military capability, and to uh, demonstrate them uh, uh, during the last four days, but uh, furthermore. So actually Iran was and remained uh, um, a multi-dimension threat um, that not only focused on the uh, nuclear, but also regarding terror and subversion. Um, I think also Israel need to um, put focus, how can we uh, straighten the Palestinian Authority, whether uh, in order to um, avoid the collapse of the Palestinian Authority, but also um, just to um, emerge any chance that in the future, uh, the Palestinian Authority maybe will manage to go back to um, uh, Gaza Strip and to uh, con take control there. Now I'll try to show um, the Israeli side, how did we get to this uh, terrible uh, uh, war that start only four days. And as I said, it uh, will last for a long time as I assume. Um, we actually knew about the Hamas strategy. We, um, um, we uh, 
Hamas all the time talk about the great campaign, the military campaign that will lead to the um, um, destroy or defeat of uh, Israel. We also speculated what is going to be this kind of a, a campaign. So uh, we um, we said it will be multi-dimension campaign, which means through the air, through the land, through the air. Uh, it will be combined, which means rocket, uh, raids, kidnapping, and a multi-Palestinian um, arena. Uh, according to Hamas, and they all the time talk about it, their vision was that West Bank, Jerusalem, um, uh, Gaza Strip, uh, the North border and also Israeli Arabs uh, will unify and will uh, uh, defeat Israel. So, um, according to the Hamas, the whole um, a campaign, big campaign, was actually prepared to uh, create this condition in order to establish um, um, an Islamic state between the river and the sea. This is what the thing. So. Over the years, there was kind of wishful thinking, um, illusion, or I don't know uh, how to um, talk about it, but there was kind of um, um, thought that maybe Hamas, that has become sovereign in the Gaza Strip, um, will be slowly, um, uh, gradually more moderate, um, and its obligation to the civilian aspect will be much more bigger than its obligation to the resistance and to the military, to the military capability. Um, I must say that from time to time, we faced fact that shown us that Hamas is still obligate, totally obligate to their uh, goals as a terror organization and not to the civilian uh, aspect, and I will elaborate later on. So actually, um, Hamas, that actually took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, not by um, uh, election, not by reconciliation, but by terror. That, that time it, it took it from uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Fatah. Um, it was part of his DNA. Um, and Israel didn't find any solution how to deal with it beside impulse blockade. But also, this solution wasn't um, uh, with any result. And more than this, it actually jeopardized Israel because Israel all the time uh, kind of afraid that there will be humanitarian uh, crisis in the Gaza Strip. And another thing that the Palestinian Authority didn't want to go back to the, um, to the Gaza Strip, um, of course, not with the assistance of Israel from its point of view. And Israel didn't want to go back to Gaza Strip because we already went there, we've been there, and we didn't uh, uh, want to go back again. So in the reality in which there is no uh, proper solution, Israel and Hamas managed to create kind of modus vivendi. Um, actually, um, partial and temporary uh, coexistence has been created between Israel and uh, Hamas. So um, Hamas and Israel actually played kind of game. Uh, Hamas, Israel accepts the sovereignty of uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and Israel buy from Hamas um, period of relevant quiet. And this was a game that was very um, continued during the time. In return, Israel provides Hamas um, uh, easing the siege, and it was very um, um, prominent, mainly after uh, military operation or after the um, uh, return campaign during 2018, during uh, 2018 and 90, while Hamas channeled people to defense and they were act violence, uh, uh, and Israel agreed to um, actually remove the uh, siege or part of this. Now, Hamas the whole time continue to put efforts in order to build up its uh, military uh, forces. And it focused on the uh, uh, developing not only Gaza Strip, but also in other uh, 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 arena, like the West Bank. I get a couple of messages saying they can't hear you well enough. Oh. So there you go. OK. So Israel actually um, reduced the uh, scope of the uh, siege. And 
let Hamas to upgrade its capability in the Gaza Strip. But then Hamas managed to um, find another formula. The new formula was, okay, we will keep quiet on the Gaza Strip, but in the meantime, we will send our arms to the other area, which means the West Bank and we the, uh, Lebanon and Syria, and even to the Eastern Jerusalem and the Israeli uh, Arab. Um, so um, did we ask ourselves from time to time, does we find out signals that point out that uh, Hamas is uh, become moderate? Of course. And we always try to say that two a uh, decade after Hamas took control, uh, took over Gaza Strip, um, we don't find any element that showing that Hamas became a, a moderate. Hamas stay um, uh, stick to his vision, to his goal, to its uh, uh, aim, and uh, a, we don't see any element that show that it became a moderate. Some from time to time we can see that it's pragmatic, but it's not a moderate. So um, this was the a, a situation during that time, uh, and I can bring some um, um, example to show how Hamas didn't uh, agree to give up the resistance and still focus on the um, on the military buildup. And um, and I think that the fact uh, that uh, just um, passed through the years. First of all, when um, even the Palestinian Authority suggests Hamas to join the PLO, but just to accept the quartet element, which means recognize Israel and they uh, accept the uh, um, a agreement in the past, Hamas said that it won't happen. Only in 2017, uh, Senwar just uh, lectured to the uh, student, Palestinian student, and say, we will never accept uh, Israeli existence. We are all the time continuing to uh, build up our military forces. It's not, it's not going to be. Um, Hamas also uh, took advantage of the uh, easing of Israeli according, uh, according the Palestinian uh, uh, society, like uh, factories that were supposed to uh, improve the life of the um, Gazans, took advantage by Hamas in order to infiltrate um, arm to the West Bank. Um, people that Israel led them to have um, 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 treatment, medical treatment in Israel, were exploited in order to deliver messages, in order to promote terror attacks. So all the time when Hamas had the opportunity to choose between um, civilian aspect and military aspect, the uh, choose was uh, obvious. It was just be, be, uh, a, for the military aspect. Um, I must say that uh, as I said before, um, Hamas wasn't the uh, uh, exclusive uh, actor in the Palestinian area. There's also the Palestinian Authority. And I think during the years, uh, um, the, these two players that are playing zero-sum game um, find that the balance is going to change. If in the past the Palestinian Authority was stronger, now um, because Israel make ease uh, easing the blockade on the uh, Hamas, actually Hamas became stronger and stronger. And I think this is one of the mistakes that Israel did because we need to um, uh, strengthen the Palestinian Authority. As I said before, maybe in a, any chance that will, uh, the Palestinian Authority will go back to the uh, Gaza Strip and take uh, control. But the huge, I think, important things is uh, uh, my colleague here talk about is the connection between the Hamas and the uh, resistance uh, camp, the Shi camp, which means Iran Hezbollah. I think that the turning point was on uh, 2021, while um, Yechez Sanuar decided to put beside the understanding between Israel and the Hamas and launch rocket through Jerusalem. Then he managed to, first of all, to surprise Israel, but also to unify the old the uh, Palestinian arena because it was Israeli Arabs and Palestinian in the West Bank and uh, uh, in Gaza and if there, and even uh, uh, Eastern Jerusalem. So I think in this point, Iran Hezbollah understood that Hamas is kind of essence that we need uh, essence 
uh, that they need to take advantage and to cooperate, not as a sponsor, but much more kind of ally, that together they will manage to um, harm Israel from different front, and they will manage to make Israel weaker. And from Iranian point of view, if Iran, Israel is weaker, weakened, um, it cannot focus uh, on Iran. And I think this is, was a, a crucial turning um, a point. Um, I think another, um, I think that Hamas was training for a long time. I don't know, I wasn't there during the last year in the recent, but I'm sure that Hamas was practicing for a long time to in order to carry out these uh, attacks. And I think that Hamas decided that is ready, you know, when it felt, when it felt that the operational, uh, the, it has operational readiness, he it exploited the fact that Israel now thought that Israel is now weak, and uh, and also the uh, original construction uh, was uh, was there. But I think um, that all these operations indicate that. Um, from the beginning, Hamas was a radical movement and it remained a radical movement um, led by radical and cruel cool, uh, leadership and it all the way uh, remained true to his vision, which is destroy and diminish uh, Israel. Um, this is the main thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Reif, Reif Lomari. All right, thank you very much, Rob. Um, thank you, uh, Naomi and uh, Matt. If I may, Rob, I want to start the way that Ehud started with a personal note. You know, and I say this because over the last couple of days since Saturday, I've seen a lot on social media and on uh, traditional media attempts to explain, justify what Hamas was doing. Let's be clear. I know we're going to talk about policy. We need to talk about policy and all of that. But let's be very clear. What happened was terrorism. There is no other way to describe it. What happened, the, the, the heinous uh, scenes that we have seen are cannot be justified. Nothing justify them. We need to have that moral clarity as we approach this issue. Of course, we need to talk about uh, policy issues, the conduct of the Israeli response, etc. But at the foundation of it is an immoral act taken by a terrorist organization intentionally hitting civilians for political gain. This we have to be very clear about. Now, what I will try to do today is to really talk a bit about more about Hamas, what it is, uh, what our objective is, its objective is, both from this operation and uh, large, and in the bigger picture, a bit about uh, what they're hoping to do in the West Bank uh, arena in particular, and maybe uh, conclude with a couple of notes for the policy recommendations for the administration. So what is Hamas? Hamas is, uh, you know, a Palestinian society like every other Arab society has always had uh, a component that is Islamist, that is a believer in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, approach to Islamism. Um, yet, uh, traditionally, the Islamists in the Palestinian arena really remained outside the nationalist, uh, outside the, if you wish, the liberation uh, struggle. They were doing uh, religious work, charity, etc. This changed in 1987. In 1987, with the first intifada has just uh, started, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Palestine decided that they need to create their own uh, organization that will get involved uh, in in this uh, dynamic. And Hamas was created. Hamas is an acronym that stands for the Islamic Resistance Movement. Interestingly, the word Palestine does not uh, appear on it because they always saw themselves as something bigger than simply Palestine. Initially. In the 1980s, Hamas was really an irritant. You know, uh, I said, of course, a violent irritant, a bloody irritant, but it was not seen as a strategic threat. This changes, this changed with the Oslo Accords. With the Oslo Accords, that was the chance for Hamas to distinguish itself when the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, bought into the idea of diplomacy and a two state solution. This was the um, opportunity for Hamas to start distinguishing itself. It came very strong in opposition to Oslo, in opposition to any kind of accommodation with Israel, and a renewed commitment to violence uh, and terror. This uh, played out in much of the 1990s uh, with catastrophic events after the assassination of Prime Minister uh, Itzhak Rabin in Israel, where Hamas engaged in a number of uh, suicide bombings that uh, arguably shaped the trajectory of both Oslo and Israeli uh, politics. But Hamas's real rise to prominence happened in the Second Intifada. 
in the second intifada with the resort to uh, terror and uh, vi- and uh, violence as a way of uh, uh, dealing with uh, with uh, israel hamas could no one could compete with hamas uh, terror violence is what hamas does and what it uh, does well and when the palestinian when fatah rather the uh, uh, um, the main secular uh, movement started adopting some of hamas's own terror uh, uh, tactics Hamas's paradigm got, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, validated. Long story short, uh, by 2006, as the Intifada was uh, um, ending, the Palestinian Authority called for an election. Hamas ran in this election. Hamas was very smart, realizing that the Palestinian public at that point was still scarred from the violence in the Intifada, did not run on a on a, a terror uh, platform, though they never uh, renounced terror. Rather, they used the Palestinian Authority's main vulnerability, um, corruption, poor governance, etc., and they won the elections. Uh, a year for ensued in which there were tensions between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas ended up with a civil war. In, in, in 07, Hamas took over uh, Gaza, and ever since, Hamas has been uh, the governing authority um, in Gaza. Now, that period, and I think my colleagues uh, talked a bit about it, was a very interesting uh, period. Hamas used it for a number of reasons, the governance of Gaza, for a number of objectives. Uh, part of the objective, Naomi and uh, Matt mentioned, terror buildup, etc. But there was also a political objective. Hamas saw the idea of governing territory as a vehicle to legitimize itself in the public, dis- in the international discourse. Hamas was presenting itself as, look, we're governing, we are moderating, deal with us uh, as a legitimate uh, authority. And in doing this, they were actually being supported by some of the regional uh, supporters. We talk about Iran as a regional supporter for Hamas, and that is true. But Hamas has two other regional supporters who support the whole Muslim Brotherhood um, approach, and these are Qatar and Turkey. And they were really pushing uh, the Hamas narrative that Hamas is legitimate, they've been organizing um, dialogue between Hamas and different Western uh, interlocutor. So Hamas was trying to mainstream, and they used some very clever tactics. For example, a few years ago, they came up with a new political document that they uh, marketed as a change to their charter, which it was not, which was quite clever. They said we were willing to accept Israel, uh, sorry, a, two, a Palestinian state on the 67 borders, yet, and the world, many in the world, uh, focused on that part of their statement. Forget the second part. We will never accept Israel. Because the very idea of a two-state solution is one that is anathema to what Hamas stands for. Now, in its governance uh, in Gaza, though they did get some of these diplomatic uh, and mainstreaming uh, benefits, they also faced uh, some of the challenges uh, with governance, particularly the exposure of their very nature. You know, they did win the elections in 06, and they did uh, convincingly. Yet, governing Gaza, it was very clear that they were as corrupt as the Palestinian Authority, that their... uh, uh, were as intolerant, even more intolerant than uh, anyone else of any kind of dissent. Uh, today, if you look at public opinion polling, Hamas is not governing by any stretch of the imagination for being popular. They are governing by force, by oppression, uh, etc. I would recommend a series of short interviews with Gaza and, uh, in the civilians living in uh, Gaza um, under Hamas called Whispered in Gaza to give you a flavor of what it is like living under Hamas. Nor was Hamas the only available uh, power in uh, in uh, Gaza that was being. They had an interesting love hate relation with some other factions, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad being the most uh, obvious. Yet Hamas undoubtedly is the uh, uh, undisputed leader in uh, Gaza, and uh, there is no political way to dislodge it uh, in the short term. Now. Let's move to what happened uh, this weekend. And why did Hamas uh, do what it did? I think my colleagues mentioned some of the kind of uh, big picture strategic objectives, derailing the Saudi-Israeli rapprochement, uh, uh, helping Iran and its access project uh, its power, but also there were domestic uh, political objectives of what Hamas did that relate to the Palestinian arena, whether in the West Bank or, uh, or I wouldn't call it Palestinian, but uh, within Israel uh, itself. And let me quickly go to the Israeli part. Hamas did uh, hope and still hopes, uh, we're still at the very early uh, days of uh, these events, that we have a repeat of what happened a few years ago when there were clashes between Hamas and Israel and we saw intercommunal uh, violence between Israeli uh, Arabs and uh, Israeli Jews. They are hoping for that. They are hoping, frankly, that uh, some of the members of the current Israeli government uh, will feed those flames. 
I am not an expert on Israeli politics, enough to say, though, that we are seeing some very courageous voices coming from within some Israeli Arabs, particularly former, uh, actually current uh, member of Knesset, Mansour Abbas, who are urging towards uh, de-escalation. But the real focus of Hamas has been on the West Bank. And for the West Bank, they have actually three objectives, uh, interconnected objective. First, they hope that they will uh, uh, use the West Bank as a way of opening another front, meaning using terror uh, attacks. So far, we have seen no successful terror attacks coming from uh, uh, the West Bank. Whether they will succeed or not remains to be seen. They have also been hoping to mobilize the public to stand up, basically to ignite a third intifada. And in doing this, they had actually an assessment of uh, the situation in the West Bank. They have seen the weakness and fragility of the Palestinian Authority, and we'll get to that uh, in a minute. And they are hoping that the anger that the public has, on the one hand, towards the Palestinian Authority, on the one hand, on the other hand, towards Israel, will translate into uh, mass uh, uh, demonstrations. So far, this has not happened uh, yet. Yes, the last couple of days, we have seen clashes, we have seen casualties, yet we have not seen that uh, uh, mobilization. I would keep a close eye on what happens this coming Friday, after the Friday prayers, often is the time of high tension. But so far, this is not going. And part of why it's not happening is the Palestinian Authority understands these threats and uh, is deploying to the extent that it can security capabilities to prevent uh, wide scale uh, uh, clashes. And the third point, which really encompasses both, is an attempt to basically um, lead to the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is extremely weak today. It's weak for a number of reasons. I think Naomi mentioned some of the reasons. Israeli policy in recent years has been uh, geared really uh, in effect to weaken the Palestinian Authority as it stabilized uh, Hamas, but also it's weak because of its own domestic uh, behavior. Corruption, poor governance, lack of political openness have created a situation where most Palestinians today, according to polls, look at the PA, the Palestinian Authority, as a liability, not uh, an asset. For Hamas, this creates uh, 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 an opening to create a vacuum and then to fill the vacuum. I will conclude maybe with a couple of uh, um, um, policy recommendations to the US as, as it relates to US uh, policy. It is too late, too early in the game to talk about very specific uh, policy recommendations, yet I would keep two things in mind as we approach in the United States, diplomatically speaking, the, co- the next uh, few weeks. One, no matter how this uh, war ends, and we don't know how it's going to end. As Rob said, this is something very different from what we saw before, and many of our old assumptions will not hold true. Yet, whatever, uh, however it, uh, the war ends, we have to make sure that Hamas does not end up uh, being able to demonstrate any win from its use of terror. There were instances in the past where uh, previous administrations were willing to consider ceasefires that would have given Hamas certain benefits. I think it is key that we make sure that we do not uh, do this. And part of doing this is to make sure that uh, when the uh, various mediators come in, that we open the space to allies in the region who agree with our objectives and not allow others who are Hamas supporters to come and lead these kinds of uh, diplomatic efforts. Yes, we will have to deal with countries like Qatar and uh, Turkey when it comes to issues like uh, hostages, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there are uh, allies who share our view, Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, and others, and they should be leading the regional uh, uh, diplomacy, and we in the United States should be supporting that. Again, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to to the conversation. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you to all my colleagues. Um, uh, We're going to take a few few questions now. I've I've got uh, a long list of questions um, uh, on the Q&A bar, as well as uh, sent in by email. I'm just going to try to, to bring them all together. Um, uh, first, um, I have a question about Hamas brutality. I mean, what we've seen, I mean, we, we've, we've all seen, regrettably, terrorist attacks before. Lots of innocents die. But it's highly unusual to, to see, as Ehud described, um, uh, the purposeful bayonetting of babies or the raping and then murdering of young girls in the context of a terrorist attack. What is going on here? What message is trying to be sent by this extent of of sort of human brutality? To be honest, I, I was not surprised. 
I think, again, Hamas, and not only Hamas, I think many in the kind of Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement have tried to distinguish themselves from the Salafi jihadi, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda types, saying we are not terrorists, we are freedom fighters. And they have tried to present this kind of image. Yet, if you look at the at the uh, at the discourse, as the narrative, at the Arabic messaging that Hamas has been engaged in since its creation, it is all about killing the Jews. It is all about uh, focusing on this kind of uh, violence. This is part of what Hamas stands for. The fact that in the past they have not had the opportunity to do this. Today they have this kind of uh, opportunity. Now I will have to say I am I am I am shocked. I am disgusted. But what I have seen, for example, in Al Jazeera uh, TV channel a Qatari-sponsored uh, Arabic-language channel that was celebrating the humanity of Hamas uh, fighters. There is a narrative that has been pushed by the Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement. Hamas tried to push that narrative. What we saw on Saturday, I think, exposes the true nature of Hamas. Anyone who has engaged with Hamas in the past knows this. If you look at how Hamas even approached its opponents on the Palestinian side, throwing them from the rooftops, etc. So none of this is surprising. You know, Hamas tried to portray this as something literally to use uh, Ismail Haniyeh's words, uh, pious um, and devoted. Uh, words matter. When you spend years othering uh, and portraying uh, the people on the other side of the fence as being responsible for every suffering you've ever had and uh, being the epitome of evil, and then you you, you you wind people up and you give them weapons of war and you break down a fence and you fling them in a direction, then you are responsible for what happens. Um, this is different than anything we've seen Hamas to before operationally, but also in terms of the brutality. It's a different type of brutality to blow up a bus. Uh, it involves fewer people. It's, it's a different type of thing. Um, and I think it really does show what Hamas is about, not only in terms of what they train their people to do, what their people have actually done, but the words they use and the radicalization that they use to mobilize people literally to violence. For all those who have seen Ham Hamas as something somewhat different, maybe a larger group that maybe some of its people engage in violence, this, this puts all of that to bed in spades. May I um, have a word, uh, Rob? Please. Thank you. When you teach your younger generation that Jews are the sons of pigs and monkeys, this is what you get. Thank you. Uh, um, it was mentioned earlier in the conversation about uh, Iran's role, and this is a high, hotly politicized and political topic here in Washington. I'd like to just dig a little deeper um, uh, among our panelists on this question. Um, uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal report about uh, um, uh, uh, asserting that Iran had uh, operational decision-making for, um, for what happened this weekend. Um, uh, what is your view of this? Um, uh, how much of this um, can be substantiated? Would you be surprised if indeed um, this were substantiated? And, and how do you think this will begin to affect Israeli decision-making as it looks forward beyond the immediate? And I, of course, the immediate uh, occupies people's attention um, quite exclusively in Israel. That? There's no way Hamas does this solely on its own. It is a matter of fact. It's, a, it's, a, it's literally a public media Googleable fact to see that Hamas and Hezbollah and Iranian Quds Force personnel have been meeting in Beirut and in Tehran over the past weeks and months. At least some of these meetings have talked about having an operational uh, joint war room of some sorts. I think a lot of people, honestly, myself included, saw that, heard that, put it someplace because you they talk about this stuff all the time. Um, I don't think we're likely to find that there were Quds Force people on the ground, that there were Iranians deciding you three people go in that direction. Hamas doesn't need that. Um, but the likelihood that Iran and Hezbollah were uh, providing strategic guidance is extremely high. And here I want to point out that this this series of attacks, this exact series of attacks comes straight out of the Hezbollah playbook that Israel's northern command has been 
practicing and training to counter for several years now, whether coming overland, underground, um, you know, in the air, uh, there were plans by the IDF to counter Hezbollah plots to enter Israeli territory, kill as many people as possible, take over towns and raise the Hezbollah flag for that media moment, capture as many people as possible, take them back into Lebanon, all while shooting rockets. This is literally out of the Hezbollah playbook. And I think part of the shock is that it happened, but it didn't happen where it was expected to happen. But this has Hezbollah and Iran's fingerprints at a strategic level all over it. We're going to need to wait some time before all of this comes out in detail. Um, but I don't think that we are going out on any uh, uh, branch uh, limb here uh, to say that uh, you know Hamas was talking and working with others. By the way, yes. Rob, if I may, just one second, Naomi. Um, traditionally, there is a tied relationship between Hamas and the and the Iran. They managed to uh, um, cross the gap between Shia and Sunnah, and the the whole time. Um, there was tight relationship, which means that after uh, when Hamas was under blockade, Iran continued to put money, put knowledge, put, put means. Now, there was only one period of time when Khaled Marshall tried to take the movement to another places, um, closer to uh, otherwise. But the uh, two main and prominent leaders now, which mean Yehe Sanwar and Salah Haruri, they are so close to the Iranian. Salah Haroul is sitting in Lebanon, meeting on a regular basis. Hezbollah and people from Iran, they are meeting, they are coordinating, they are getting money and the knowledge. Now, if somebody look for the guys that sit in the Gaza Strip and speak Persian, it's, um, it, it, it's ridiculous. Hamas wouldn't manage to get so much um, um, capabilities, military capabilities, as a state, if it wasn't Iran. Iran is more than sponsor. Iran is the ally. Iran is the address for the capabilities and of the Hamas. Okay. Ehud, thank you. Ehud, you wanted to add on this? I just wanted to say that they knew that they have uh, commitments from the Iranians they wouldn't go into this kind of operation any other way. And I think at this moment, Yechia Sinwar in the bunker under Shifa Hotel in Gaza is sure that if the Israeli divisions start getting into Gaza, there will be a major response from Hezbollah. That's the only explanation of what has happened. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I want to uh, um, uh, clarify a comment that I made earlier, and I want to thank uh, um, uh, one of our viewers for, for sending in this note. Um, uh, when I referred to one of the unique aspects of how um, what has gone on this weekend is different than 9-11, and I referred to the um, uh, sort of the brutality um, citing, uh, citing the rape that is part of what is going on. I use the term sexuality. Of course, this is not sexuality. This is brutality. Um, uh, um, uh, a rape is, 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 is a violent act, not an act of sexuality. I just use the term as, as um, uh, um, uh, to indicate what is going on, not, 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 not to suggest anything otherwise. But thank you for helping clarify um, for me and for our viewers what I was referring to. Um, I have a lot of questions from viewers about um, uh, it's very early days, but an end game for Gaza. All right, so Israel targets the Hamas leadership completely, totally. When the dust settles, when the fog clears, is Israel returning to Gaza? Is Israel reabsorbing Gaza? Is Israel handing the keys to an international force, as was suggested by New York Times columnist Brett Stevens, is Israel handing it to some local Gaza family? Who is going to be the running the uh, 
running the whatever passes for an administration in Gaza when the dust clears. First Does anybody do know? I'm sorry? First we do it, then we think. Okay, first do, then think. There's one option. Is there anyone who has thought this through yet? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, uh, the immediate reaction is uh, a, a group that did something so horrible has to be removed. It's not clear to me how you literally remove all of Hamas. And in recent uh, hours, the, some of the statements I've heard from Israel have changed a little bit. It's no longer uh, uh, destroying Hamas, removing Hamas. It's decapitating their leadership and operational capability. Um, and so it's very likely that at the end of the day, if Israel can achieve its security goals, uh, then and severely, severely uh, cut Hamas off at the knees and make it so that the group is not capable of doing anything like this or much less, at least for a long period of time, then they will pull out. There will still be what's uh, whatever is left of a Hamas leadership there uh, to run the Gaza Strip. And then the day after conversation will not be who runs the Gaza Strip, but what are the conditions for any type of resumption of aid, et cetera, uh, if in fact Hamas continues to rule there. But I don't think the Israelis or anybody else has any interest in going in and trying to rule Gaza again. If I may, just, just two points. I mean, there is no answer to this question, obviously, and uh, this is one of the reasons I would assume Israel has not done it uh, yet in the previous wars. Yet, I would say two things to keep into uh, mind as we think of this. Uh, one is, in the end, what's happening in Gaza does not only impact Israel, it has impact beyond Israel, it impacts Egypt's security, it impacts kind of some of the bigger shifts uh, in the region. And the solution, I believe, should be uh, one that's coordinated between Israel and some of these other stakeholders who need to also step in and play their own role. It's enough for the Arab world to uh, give this only to Qatar. Uh, one. Two, ultimately, the Palestinian Authority, which would have been the obvious address, cannot do it. It cannot do it because of its weakness, of its, leak of, its lack of legitimacy, credibility, etc. And I think a serious effort should be done to rebuild the Palestinian Authority, not through throwing money at it, because we know what's going to happen to this money with all the corruption, but really re-engaging in a clear, strong, directed, uh, institution building pro uh, projects for the Palestinian Authority to enable it again to come and fill a vacuum in the West Bank and uh, later on in Gaza. Any other remarks? All right, friends, we've reached the end of our time for this program. Um, as I said at the top of the hour, um, this is the first of a series of programs that we'll be having here at the Washington Institute. Um, uh, um, you will soon hear news of a program on Thursday that will address the potential for escalation on Israel's northern border, um, uh, both Hamas, uh, both Hezbollah, um, uh, the Syrian Golan aspect, um, uh, and what Iran is doing behind the scenes. And then in the days and weeks to come, we'll be back with um, further both written and programmatic um, um, uh, 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 things that you will find on our website. Um, just to reiterate, this is a fundamental moment, a fundamental moment of inflection. Um, and I hope that wherever you are, um, uh, you appreciate the depth um, of everything that has gone on in the, the Middle East this weekend and, be and begin to appreciate the seismic repercussions this will have for all of our preconceptions, all of our paradigms as we begin to approach what I regrettably think is a new Middle East not the new Middle East that we originally thought that we would have, a Middle East of uh, peace and, and common prosperity, but regrettably a new Middle East focused on this great challenge that we now face. Thank you very much um, here and abroad for joining us at the Washington Institute. Bye-bye.